something, I'm hoping. Is it on now? Still not on? We're good? All right, we're good. Well, good morning again. Sorry, my mic was not on. Good morning to you online as well. It is good um, that you are with us this morning. We hope something in this service this morning, something blesses you, something maybe you hear in the sermon, maybe some words in a song that you heard, something blesses you, and then we hope in turn you'll go out and take it out into the world and bless somebody else. But we do have a lot of things going on in the life of the church. We do ask you, um, if you are in this service already, you have been signed in already. Uh, thanks to Sarah Tarvin back there, she is signing you in as, as, as you walk in. If you are online with us, if you'll do me a favor, um, on the Facebook comment section, if you'll just say so-and-so is here, um, we'd really appreciate that. We are taking attendance from that, so if you can do that for us, that would be graciously, greatly appreciated. But we have a lot of stuff going on in the life of the church, and I just wanted to highlight a few announcements, a few things that are going on. And in this first announcement, you're going to hear a lot about in just a few seconds when Gwen comes up and talks to us. But we are stocking the pantries. One of the things we know right now is teachers are under stress. They're doing double work. They're taking care of online students. They're taking care of in-class students. They are under a lot of stress. And so what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to react to that. We're going to be stocking the pantries, uh, stocking the teacher's lounge. Is that what they call them, teacher's lounges? Yeah, we're going to be doing that. Um, Gwen's going to go over the list with you in just a second. We're going to start out with our two sponsoring schools, um, which are Fred Douglas and Piner, um, and bringing certain items to those teacher's lounges, making sure they have a snack during the day, a, a cold bottle of water um, that they can drink from. Um, if you've noticed out in the hallway here, um, people are already starting to bring stuff for that. And so um, Gwen doesn't like when I plan stuff for her, um, but I got to say, we're going to do these two schools, and our hope is to do a couple more schools after that, um, including uh, the schools in our area. So um, check out that list. Gwen's going to bring that list up with you in just a second and, and start bringing stuff. Let's make these teachers uh, have a good day. Maybe, in that, maybe that's in the form of, of a simple snack. So uh, help us out in and, and, and that mission. We're really excited about that. Um, I want to tell you, October 30th and 31st, okay, that's Halloween weekend, um, they're having a garage sale over at Casa de Esperanza, and so they want your old stuff. They want your old stuff. So if you've got stuff in a stuff, a garage full of stuff, you're just like, I know my wife is telling me to get stuff out of my garage right now, um, call Floor. Call Floor. Um, I think they've got a space designated to, to bring that stuff um, starting soon. So call Floor. Um, let her say, I've got a garage full of stuff. I need to, I need to get out of there. Um, and, you know, and they'll uh, use it for their garage sale as a fundraiser for their worship space. And so I think that's a wonderful thing. So uh, another thing we've got going on is third grade Bibles. If you have a third grader or you know of a third grader in our church that's coming up, they need to register because we're giving out third grade Bibles on October 18th. That's next week. So they need to register like really soon um, for that. So yeah, we want those third graders to, to get their first third grade Bible. I know when I got my third grade Bible, that was a big deal to me. So uh, we're really excited about those. We do welcome you to worship this morning. So I'm gonna invite Floor up for our call to worship. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Would you please raise up? What magnificent diversity of talents is represented here today. God has called us to this place to share our gifts and talents. I'm gonna live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm gonna live so God can use me anywhere, There are so many ways that we can serve the Lord. We pray that God will enable us to use our talents to help others. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. 
I'm gonna live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Our lives should be prayers of thanksgiving to God. Let our hearts be open and our voices raise in song to God, who continually blesses our lives. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Our opening hymn, Lord, you give the Great Commission. affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We, we live, live in God's world. world. We, we believe in God, who has, who has created and is creating, and is creating who, has who has come in Jesus, the Word, the word made, made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works, works in us and others by the Spirit. The Spirit. We, we trust in God. God. We, are we call to be the church, to, to celebrate God's presence, to, to love and serve others, to, to seek justice and resist, and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. Good morning. Am I on? I'm Gwen Walker, and I'm here this morning to share with you another mission opportunity. In the past few years, our church has been privileged to 
adopt three schools here within our, our school district. We've adopted Piner, Fred Douglas, and our own School for Little People. In the past, we've been able to help and support these schools by providing treats throughout the year or helping them with um, different meals throughout their different uh, celebrations in the year. And at one point, we even helped, or several years, we've helped um, Fred Douglas with their own um, Christmas dinner celebration. Last year, we were even able to provide each staff member of all three schools with a winter scarf. With the help of um, members of this congregation, we were able to provide over 200 winter scarves for all of the teachers and staff of those three schools. Needless to say, this year has been a little bit more challenging with the coronavirus going on, but we still want our teachers and staff to know that we support them. So, as Aaron had mentioned earlier, we want all of our schools to know that we support them and that we think that they deserve a break. So we're going to stock their break rooms. We're going to be stocking the Piner Teacher Lounge on October 19th, which will be not this coming week, but the next week. Fred Douglas Break Room will be stocked on November 12th, and the School for Little People will be stocked at a, a date in January. We're asking you to help in two different ways. If you would like to, you um, can help buy the different snacks and um, surprises for the teachers and the lounges. Um, we, we need things such as bottled water, soft drinks, individually wrapped snacks, chocolate is always a favorite, fresh fruit, pretzels, cookies, cheese sticks, yogurt, anything that's quick and fast for teachers and staff to run in and grab and just have a little um, enjoyment to their day. If you would rather not go out and do the shopping, we'll be glad to do the shopping for you. If you prefer, you can donate money to the church, and we will um, send people out and come up with snacks to stock all three schools. Our main goal is that we want the schools to know that they are appreciated, that we support them. We know this year has been a stressful year for them, and so we want them to know that they have people supp supplying them with prayers and goodies. Piner has 120 staff members, Fred Douglas has 68, School for Little People has 16, so we want to be able to provide for over 200 uh, people. Please help us stock our break rooms and help us to show the teachers and staff that we do support them and we do care for them. I want to thank you in advance for all of your help. We come now, time for our hymn of preparation, What Gift Can We Bring? Today is, in fact, the last day of our stewardship series, and some of you are probably ready to cheer where you are, um, and I think the staff is ready to cheer where they are as well. But uh, let me say this, we understand that stewardship is something that the church relies on, that there are people who make 
the mission and ministry of the church possible because of their generosity. And that's who you are. You are a generous people and you give generously to the church. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for that every week. But, and it's not just a rote saying. We truly do thank you for all that you do in faith to keep the mission of this church going. Next week, we're going to be starting our Jesus 2020 sermon series. And there's been some chatter about that among our members, and that's a good thing. That's what we're wanting. We're actually going to be reading out of the Gospels, and we're going to be preaching on the words of Jesus. Jesus has a lot to say about how we live our lives. And so for the few weeks of that sermon series, we'll be preaching out of Matthew's Gospel, and we hope that you will um, tune in if you're online or, or come and be ready to hear, you know, some of what Jesus has to say about the way we live and about how we treat one another. And so I'm looking forward to that. Next week, Abby Eccles will be preaching. Uh, she is going to be doing a message about some of the things Jesus had to say specifically about children while we are also giving our children their Bibles. And so I hope that you will be here uh, and celebrate the children among us um, as we gather together as God's people. Today, we will be hearing, however, not from the Gospels, but from St. Paul, uh, his letter to the Romans, starting in the 12th chapter. So listen now to these words of Paul. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned." For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the early 2000s, Ty Pennington was very popular on HGTV. He had two specific remodeling shows. One, which was my favorite, was Trading Spaces. And in Trading Spaces, uh, two homeowners would choose to uh, allow the other person to remodel one room in their home. Uh, they were helped with the Trading Spaces staff, and they were given $1,000 and 24 hours. That's it, 24 hours to redo the room. And so uh, each person would go to the other's home and they couldn't go back and you know, look at what the other was doing. And in 24 hours, the one family would you know, redecorate and remodel the rooms. At the end of that 24 hours, the homeowners would go back to their actual homes and see what that room looked like. There were only two reactions. Either it was absolute joy and excitement because the room met every expectation they could have, that it could have, or it was absolute horror at what the room turned into. And, you know, I watched that show faithfully because it was always exciting to see what the rooms were. And sometimes I loved them, and sometimes I was as horrified as the homeowners were. But the truth is, is that when you watched that show, you realized that all the changes that were made were cosmetic, right? Nobody was knocking out walls or, or taking out windows or anything like that. Everything was a surface change that could be brought back to the way it was, you know, with $1,000 and a couple of hours of work. But there was the other show that Pennington had, and it was called Extreme Makeover. And the title alone tells you what that show was about. Uh, 
But I'm thinking that some of you have no idea of who Ty Pennington is, so I'm going to bring us to a little more modern day show similar to that. And it was the Chip and Joanna Gaines show called Fixer Upper. And I know, see, there's a bunch of you nodding your heads. You know Fixer Upper, right? Fixer Upper was a show where somebody would buy an older or really old and uncared for home in the Waco area somewhere in that Waco area. And uh, Chip and Joanna would work with the homeowners to remodel the home. But this wasn't just paint and moving some furniture around. This was major demolition. They would go in and knock out walls and tear out bathrooms and kitchens. And very often the front porch came off. And, you know, so when the homeowners actually went to their home, it was totally transformed. It wasn't just rearranged. It was a whole new home. And, you know, the truth is, is that they were beautiful homes. There was very rarely a time where I thought, oh, I really don't like that. And John and I both watched it all the time because we did that to the last house we owned before we moved to Sherman. Gutted it and started over. Um, I think in Paul's letter to us today, he's telling the church in Rome, and he's telling us that God isn't asking for people to simply rearrange their lives to follow Jesus. I think what Paul is asking us is to have an extreme makeover, to start brand new in grace with Jesus. You see, and, and I think that that's really the point of what Jesus wants from us anyway. Jesus just doesn't want us to rearrange our lives and our thinking for some moral or ethical imperative. I think what Jesus is asking for us to do is to actually be transformed in the way that we think and in the way we treat each other and in the way we worship God. And, and I believe that Paul is getting at this by saying, individually, we're all gifted people, but none of that really matters if we're not together sharing life together. That that transformation doesn't happen just by ourselves, though it does start to happen individually, but it actually takes place in community together. Little by little, we as individuals are transformed by grace, and together we become a transformed community. But the question always is how? How do we do that? And Paul tells us how to do that, right? He says to us this, Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm not sacrificing myself at all, right? Because the imagery, biblical imagery around sacrifice is not pretty imagery. I mean, in the first century, people fully understood this. When you, if you were a good Jew, who Paul is, you know, specifically targeting here, uh, along with the pagans who had the same kind of practices, by the way. But if you were a good Jew and you did something wrong and you needed to atone for a sin, you brought the lamb to the altar and the priest sacrificed it, right? Blood everywhere. If you wanted to give thanksgiving to God, you brought a dove or two and the priest sacrificed it. And everything was good as long as you made that kind of sacrifice, but what Paul is saying is that's not even necessary anymore because Jesus has already done it for us. Jesus is the sacrifice. So no more sacrifices like that. Now what God wants is you, your whole self, living sacrifice, which means that everything you say, everything you do, everything you think needs to kind of line up with the good and perfect will of God. That's the sacrifice. And it's not a one-time sacrifice either. This is an ongoing day-to-day -day reality for all people. But if that was enough for Paul, then we could just be done and we can say, okay, I'm going to give my whole self to God. But Paul actually tells us how to give our whole selves to God. And that's where the text gets a little mm, scary maybe. Paul says that we should not be conformed 
to this world, the world we live in, but that we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The whole way we think, the whole way we see one another, the whole way we practice what we say we believe needs to change, not just be rearranged. And that's the part of the text that starts to get a little, eh, I don't know, uncomfortable for us maybe? Because here's the deal. How easy is it for us to be conformed to this world? Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, I'm not conformed. I mean, that's how I thought when I read that. I'm a good, I'm a good Christian, right? But mm, maybe not. Let's think about what conformity actually is. We're going to start with something really easy. Let's talk about what's hanging in our closets. Are we squirming just a little bit? Right? This year, jeans with holes seem to be the thing. But how about when it was dark wash, straight leg jeans? How many of those do you have in, in your drawers or in your closet? Or how about when it was skinny and not boot cut jeans? Or high rise as opposed to low rise? Do not be conformed. <laughs> Are you hearing the words? Men, tucked or untucked shirts. There was a company made just for you so that you could decide whether your shirts would be tucked into your pants or left outside of your pants. You, I'm not kidding. My son has three of those shirts. Uh, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. Now perhaps we need to think about commitment. Let's talk about commitment for just a moment. Not long. Social scientists have said that most married couples will not be faithful at least once in the course of their marriage. And as a pastor, and perhaps some of you already know this, uh, we are really good at making excuses and we justify our behavior because, well, if everybody else is doing it, one indiscretion is not going to cause a problem, right? Conformity has many heads. As a matter of fact, this kind of conformity plays out on TV in shows like, which... You know, some of us have watched these, The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, because who needs covenantal relationships where you can get satisfaction without the covenant? This is conformity. And, and let's laugh for one minute. Let's think of the food we eat. Is kale a garnish on a dish, or are we really supposed to eat it? I mean, I just have to wonder about that. No. Uh, but then there's more practical things like eggs and butter, right? At one time, eggs and butter were really good for you, and then somebody said, no, they're not good for you, and so people moved to things like egg substitutes and margarine. And then the doctor said, that's polluting your body, and you're getting sick from that, and so we went back to the real deal. I mean, we are conforming without even knowing it. Paul knows that about us. And so he's telling us, do not be conformed to the ways of this world, and there is a better way. Slick marketing and the speed of technology are causing us to lose our focus on what is really important for us. And, you know, we might laugh about it, but this is serious stuff. Because while we are wondering if our genes are the correct genes this year... Poverty is rising, suicide is rising, people are lonely. People in our congregation are lonely. This is not the mark of somebody or some community that is not transformed. We need to take seriously this call to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Because we can be different than the rest of the world. We do not have to go along to get along. That's Paul's good news for us. There is another way. You know, as I think historically about when this started, I have to think back to uh, some of the philosophy classes that I took. And, and while that sounds, you know, over the top, some of you know exactly what I'm going to say. Uh, way back in the day, there was this man named Descartes. And he said, 
I am, or I think, therefore I am. We've heard that thrown around. Maybe you didn't know it was a philosopher, but that's where it came from. It was the beginning of this idea that individuals are the most important thing in their own lives and that the world revolves around them. And so as you continue to think and grow in your mind, you are important and more and more important as an individual than, than as part of a community. And we've seen that play out the strength and the power of individualism, the I can pick my own self up by my own bootstraps kind of thinking. Biblical philosophy says something else. Biblical philosophy says, I am because you are. I am. I am respected. I am worthy. I am important. I have value because you are respected you have value, you have worth, you have dignity. And together, we can change the world much more than one individual person can do. That's the beauty of being a community that is transformed by the renewing of our minds. We don't have to do what other people are doing. We can actually do the things that Jesus has called us to do. And, and again, there's the challenge. Let's think about what Jesus has called us to do, just for a minute. If you want to be rich, you must be poor. If you, must, if you want to lead, you must follow. If somebody has harmed you, you must forgive them, not just seven times, but seven times 70 times. If you have an enemy, you're supposed to pray for them because what good is it to just pray for people who love you and who do good things for you? And as a matter of fact, if you have any idea at all that these people that you are in relationship with are going to harm you, not only are you supposed to serve them, but you're supposed to get on your hands and knees and literally wash their feet. Who's up for any of that? impossible. It seems impossible. We're not hardwired to do any of that. And yet that's what it means to live a transformed life. It's to do those kinds of things. And listen, I'm going to tell you as a pastor that there are days I think, no, just don't want to do it. But yet that's what Jesus is saying to us. And Jesus is also saying to us, and until you start doing it, it's going to continue to be difficult. You see, the beauty of doing what Jesus has asked us to do is that the more we do it, the more our minds and our bodies and our souls automatically do those things. It takes practice and it takes work. Alan Hirsch, who was the founder of the church missional movement, actually said this, I simply do not believe that we can continue to try to think our way into a new way of acting. Now, I'm just going to stop at the end of that because we are a thinking people. We like to believe that we can think certain things and we are automatically there. I'm looking around this room. Most of you in this room not just have bachelor's degrees, but many of you have master's or PhDs. And we like to believe that we can think our way into a new way of acting. But he says this, rather we need to act our way into a new way of thinking. We need to do it, we need to do the work of Jesus in community until it becomes who we are. That's what he's saying here. Do the work and sooner or later you will actually begin to reflect the one you say you follow. It's every day. It's not just on Sunday. See, because on Sunday we can say what we believe and we can stand up and cheer. We are God's people. But what happens on Monday morning when we're not in a safe space anymore? That's the challenge of living a transformed life. But the beauty and the freedom of that is that we have a whole community that can support us in the doing 
of the work of Jesus Christ in the world. Transformed individuals are a transformed community that use their gifts and their graces for the benefit of others, not just for the benefit of ourselves. And it is possible for us to do that. It's possible for us to be the people that Jesus is calling us to be, the people that Paul is exhorting us to be, to say, you can do this together. You can make this happen. You not only transform yourself and your family, but you transform all the people whose lives you begin to touch. You actually start to close the gap of divisiveness in the world. You actually begin to be your brothers and sisters keepers. You actually begin to live life fully in a world filled with death dealing. That's what a transformed community does. A transformed community is one in ministry to all the world today, right here and right now. And I believe that it also gives people a glimpse, even if it's just for a moment, of what we pray every week. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Perhaps it's time for the church, Christ's body, to do more than just say it, but to actually live it. May it be so.
and the people of God respond, thanks be to God. I hope you all who are a part of the choir and Jeremy and the rest of the staff know how much we appreciate having people in these chairs. It is so different to sit up here in this big chancel area with nobody there but us three or four people who are leading worship. It is just special and we appreciate that so much and we do uh, ask God's blessing upon uh, your talent and your skill and the uh, joy that we all have as we can come together and be in worship. This morning as we come to our time of prayer there are several things that I want to uh, lift up. First of all I want us to remember and continue to keep in a prayer our friends and neighbors in the Gulf states uh, who it just seems like cannot get a break from these hurricanes. And uh, we would, uh, would lift up those who are now suffering from the uh, uh, effects of uh, Hurricane uh, Delta and uh, ask that you be with them and continue to bless them and uh, lead them as they go through the process of putting their lives back together again. And any way that we can be a part of that, uh, I know we will want, to, uh, we'll want to do that. And the people of God responded, Lord, hear our prayers. Also would lift up uh, our president and first lady and all of those who are a part of our government who are uh, fighting the uh, COVID-19 battle. Uh, I know there are people everywhere who are fighting that battle, and we lift them up as well, but simply because the leaders of our, of our nation are uh, uh, suffering from that, we simply uh, remind ourselves of that again. And as the people of God, we respond, Lord, hear our prayers. I know there are a number in our congregation who are ill from a variety of different things, and we simply would lift them up uh, collectively and ask that uh, God would uh, uh, watch over them and encourage them as they uh, uh, seek to be made well again. And as the people of God, we respond, Lord, hear our prayers. Uh, <clears throat> so as we remember those things, as we uh, uh, share the spirit of uh, togetherness here in our service of worship this morning, and as we carry that spirit out into the world in which we live, let us bow as we pray. We do, O oh God, lift up to you this day our prayers, simply asking that you hear them. And we know that's somewhat redundant. You hear our prayers. You respond to our prayers. But as you hear them, you already know our needs you already understand the directions that we are seeking. And you help us to know that when we mention our friends or our neighbors or our family members in a special way, you're there too. And it brings a great sense of peace and confidence to each of us as we pray and know that you hear our prayers, but to know also that you are in the midst of our lives before we even lift it up to you. So with that being said, we pray for those persons who are affected by the hurricane. We pray for those who across our nation and our world who are fighting the battle with COVID-19. We pray for those that we know who are our neighbors and friends and family members who are facing surgery and other medical issues. We simply again ask that you be with them. And this morning we pray in keeping with Pastor Denise's sermon for the strength and courage to be that person that focuses on your call upon our lives. 
whether it means we stand in the pulpit, whether we share our talents and skills as musicians, or whether it simply means that we come together to bring a bottle of cold water for one who would teach our children. Whatever we can do, however we are challenged and however we respond to that challenge, our prayer is that you would help us to give it our best, give it our all. We ask this morning that you forgive us of our shortcomings. And that as we come to that place in our service where we pray our Lord's Prayer, we would simply say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as we come to this time in our worship service where um, we normally take up the offering, I would invite you that if you have your offering with you this morning and you'd like to leave it in a plate, there are plates at the front and there is one in the back, but also if you have brought your pledge card with you, and I think most people at this point have mailed them in, to be honest with you. We have a stack of them in the office, but if you have brought your pledge card with you and you feel compelled to walk to the bowls this morning and to leave your pledge card in the plate, we would love for you to do that, and during the playing of the hymn, uh, you are invited to do that. Do not feel rushed to do it. I will say we don't have extras. Um, only because we weren't sure that we were going to be able to do this today. So if you're doing this, I'm also going to ask you to remember that social distancing is really important. And I know that normally when we invite people to come forward, all of you like to come at one time and stand together, okay? Not today. If you're coming forward, even to leave your offering, please make sure that there is space between you and the person in front of you for safety reasons. Uh, we thank you for your continued generosity, for the pledges that will be made, for those of you who are not going to pledge and continue to give generously from all that God has blessed you with. The mission of this church really does make a difference in our community. And I just rejoice with you in all that we have been able to do and all that we will continue to do in the name of Jesus as we witness to the power of transformed lives in this congregation.
our closing hymn, the final two verses of Lord, You Give the Great Commission. this benediction. Just a short story about the house we used to live in and transformation. We had gutted that house, added a room. I, I mean, the house didn't look anything like it did when we purchased it 22 years earlier. And then we decided the one room that was never transformed was the master bath, and so we knocked out walls, we replaced all kinds of plumbing, did all kinds of work, and then I got this phone call that said, you're moving to Sherman. That was right after my husband bought the heated flooring. <clears throat> um, but here's the beauty about transformed lives, is that you don't always get to see the results of what happens in other people because you have lived a transformed way with a renewed mind and a renewed heart and a renewed soul. Sometimes someone else gets to enjoy your blessing, your life, your work, and that's just as Jesus intended it. We don't always get to enjoy everything that we have or do. We don't always get to see how our transformation will affect someone else, but it does. And we, we are just the agents of Jesus, a transformed individual transforming the community that we're called to live in and to be with and to serve. May we be one with Christ and one with each other in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.